do the rule of law and separation of powers work? You've often heard about the phrase rule of law. It's always related to another concept called the separation of powers. What do these phrases mean? Well, I hope to answer your questions on these today. Hello, my name is GK Gunnison and welcome to another episode of GK TV. Today's topic is how do the rule of law and separation of powers really work? I need to speak to you about the concept called the rule of law. It's easy to understand. You needn't be a lawyer to know what it is. You can guess. It's an idea that lives in all of us. Think about it. If there is a law, it must first of all be fair and it must be the same law for everyone and it must be obeyed by all whether you're a popperdom seller or a prime minister when a policeman arrests someone he must observe and obey all the law whether he thinks he's arresting a murderer a thief or a saint when a government does anything it cannot do what it likes it must follow the laws of the nation so also the parliament it can't do what it likes it's got its own rules neither the government nor the parliament can make any law that bullies people or treat one set of people differently from another set of people we now move on to the concept called the separation of powers it's not a difficult idea it's a tool that makes the rule of law work it's good to start with basic in democratic theory a nation is governed by three separate institutions or organs the legislature read parliament the judiciary read the court and the executive the administration or the government one arm cannot interfere with another that is the theory let's see how it works in practice parliament makes the law if a political party has at least two-thirds majority in parliament, we have 222 seats. For two-thirds, you need 148 seats. It can even change the constitution, but it cannot change the constitution so as to fiddle with it or destroy basic rights. Basic rights are the right to life, the right to equality, the right to have or practice one's faith or a right to freedom of expression. It cannot change the constitution to make a new law that says, for example, kill all babies with blue eyes. Can it do that? It can't because it will deprive the person, in this case the baby, of the right to life. So when parliament makes such a law, it's called an unconstitutional law. Now, at that time, the judiciary can knock parliament and declare, hey, that law is unconstitutional and we are striking it down. Now, as for the second limb, the judiciary, by that I mean the judges, they must apply parliamentary law. Should they apply it blindly, whether it's fair or unfair? First of all, when there are gaps or ambiguities in the law, the judges fill in the gaps or explain the ambiguities. They put in what they think parliament intended, but they cannot go beyond that. To make new law is parliament's duty and not the duty of the judges. The judges cannot interfere. They must obey parliament's law. Now the third arm, the government or Krajan as we call it, is bound to obey parliamentary laws and the decisions of the judiciary. Now parliament can say to the judges or to the government, you people are not interpreting or enforcing the laws we make the way we want you to. If we say to you, hang a fellow who is a drug trafficker, why are you handing out life sentences? Now we are making new laws. Hanging it is. You obey. This really happened, you know, during Mahade's time. And so both the government and the judiciary have to obey. So instead of sending the trafficker to jail, he's sent to the gallows. He's hung. But sometimes the judiciary can say to parliament and to the government, we are not listening to parliament or the government. What you have done is not fair. Suppose a man has been thrown out of a job, he must have a right to be hurt. You can't just kick him out, no matter what you both say. So also, quite unlike the previous regime, the government cannot order parliament or the judiciary any way it wants. It cannot interfere. So these are the checks and balances. Now, is there a 100% separation of powers or is there a fusion of powers? In reality, there's no such thing as a 100% separation of power, whether in the United Kingdom, in the United States or any part of the Commonwealth. It's a legal fiction, a charita. Why? Because in Malaysia, the parliament and the government are said to be fused. Let me explain. In truth and in substance, those occupying senior posts in the government, the cabinet, for example, must be members of the Dewan Rakyat. Article 43 of the constitution demands that. And members of the cabinet control the government and sit in parliament also. And they also control how the laws are passed. Now, the prime minister, who is a member of parliament and the leader of the government, will also directly influence who is to be recommended as the chief justice. The president 
president of the court of appeal or the two chief judges of the high courts of Malaya and Borneo and every judge article 122 capital B gives him that privilege so the leader of the government the prime minister does have power over the courts in some limited extent now deputy ministers and parliamentary secretaries must also be members of either house that's in articles 43 capital A and 43 B now the speakers of both the Devan Raya and the Devan Nagara are elected by members of each house yet deputy ministers and parliamentary secretaries form also part of the government the prime minister directly influences who are appointed as ministers deputy ministers or parliamentary secretaries the prime minister will also indirectly influence who is elected as the speaker of either house you saw an example recently so who is the person who speaks for the government and parliament the prime minister who pages the wages of the judges parliament article 1 to 5 sub paragraph 6 so even parliament holds the purse strings of the judiciary so this helps in the checks and balances because power wasn't monopolized by one man or one group of person so it's rather inaccurate to argue that there is absolutely no fusion of powers of the three organs of government in Malaysia now let's compare the Malaysian system with the United Kingdom and the United States you realize of course the Malaysian Prime Minister and his UK counterpart have the same duties and the same power Powers. There is much commonality in the way the three institutions of both nations function. You know why? They sprung from the same template. Now, in the UK, this system has worked very well for ages, but it all did not start out as a bed of roses. There were wars, there were horrid confrontations, blood was shed, off went some heads. In some cases, even those of good people, all that is gone now. We are far luckier. We managed to copy UK's robust system with a minimal loss of life and suffering, if any. Our problem is not because of the system, but is in spite of it. Why? Because it nearly crashed on our heads because some of our past leaders didn't follow the rules of law. They didn't care about the separation of powers. It was all the same to him. They used the nation as if it belonged to them. They took what they liked, when they liked, and how they liked. You saw examples of that. When questions were raised, we were lectured about Bangsa, Nagara, Danagama. Good prime ministers and good leaders are self-disciplined. They will not stray into the independence of parliament or that of the judiciary. They understand the meaning of the phrase separation of powers. They will obey its precepts even if they don't like it. They will always ensure that there is a high level of transparency in their dealings and all-round consultation with the three organs of government. Leaders don't mind being raked over hot coals. Judges understand that their rulings can be flayed, questioned, probed. Members of parliament can expect to be rebuked. This is all part of the discipline of following the separation of powers it goes with the territory so even in a few system there is substantial or perhaps a high degree of separation of powers being a little fuse doesn't mean one branch dictates to the other even in the United States the way the system is built is almost the same the United States Congress is just like our Dewan Nagara and the Dewan Rayat in Malaysia it's called a bicameral system meaning two chambers. Two houses make the US legislature, the Senate and the House of Representatives. But there is more formal separation. Yet even they copied the system from the UK and the rule of law from both the UK and Europe. But in the United States, leaders in parliament and government are different people. The US constitution dictates it so. A man cannot be a US president and at the same time sit in Congress. Quite unlike our system. Amazing, isn't it? Suppose the US system is imported into Malaysia, then this is what will happen. For example, Assume party X is in power, the party leader Mr. A or Madam B will be elected as the leader of the House of Representatives. Another separate and independent party X leader Mr. C or Madam D will then be elected as the Malaysian Prime Minister by separate election. That's how it happens in the United States. In the US, candidates vying to become judges of the Supreme Court are security veterans and they are shortlisted by the White House. That's in Article 2 of the United States Constitution. The fruits of their labors are examined under a microscope. Their published decisions, their articles, their speeches and other background information. This provides an idea of the candidates core values and their views on constitutional issues. The nominee's age, 
health, gender, all these figure in the selection process. They are then sent over to and are independently and often publicly grilled by the Senate Judiciary Committee. The committee then reports to the Senate, a vote is taken, only a simple majority is required. Confirmation hearings may sometimes take months. Imagine that. Answer this question. How do you think our federal court and court of appeal judges will fare when they are put through a process like this? You're right. We will have the best legal mind sitting on the bench and those who dare face the test will have the courage of a pride of lions. It's probable as history has shown us that the White House backs candidates who are of the same party as the president. It is political, yes I agree, but the separation is still there. But there is this fusion. Now I want to talk about ethical leadership. In the more advanced nations, they are careful to observe the rule of law. They are not all saints, but they try not to be funny and defeat the work of another arm of government or they get thrown out. Their leaders practice ethical leadership. There the leaders of all three institutions are very careful about each other. They don't stray into another sphere of influence. This is what is called the separation of powers. Each institution is not only separate, but independent. That's why they are considered more advanced than some banana republics of the Commonwealth. You know, Malaysia nearly turned into one in the last five years, until you people came and saved the nation in May of 2018, and then see what happened. The laws and the systems, not only in Malaysia, but of the entire Commonwealth, comprising as it does 53 countries across all continents, with a combined population of 2.36 billion people, follow the UK bicameral system of rule of law and separation of powers. Ours, like the UK system of government, is a constitutional monarchy. It's a democracy with the king as its titular head. Without a royal ruler, such a system is called a republic. Singapore is a republic. India is a republic. There the supreme power of the land is held by the people, the Raya, and the elected representative, the MPs, and their leader is an elected or nominated president. Some 94% of the citizens of the Commonwealth live in Asia. Of those, 1.26 billion are in India. In other words, 33% of the world runs on UK law. Almost all the rest of the world is run on some form of rule of law. The rest are not based on the rule of law. They are mere despots or religious regimes. Over the years, the British and the US systems have worked well. Not perfect, but well. In the UK, the judiciary has openly acknowledged that it needs to be totally independent of the House of Commons and the House of Lords. Even the judiciary had a description .gov at the end of the Supreme Court judge's email. It was removed last year and this news of this great emancipation was sent out on Twitter as if hailing a great moral victory, which indeed it was. Now, our current government has inherited a malformed structure. Our current leaders need to beat it back into shape, rip off each fuse institution and grant them their separate identities and independence. Even so, this very minute we can observe all the fawning right before our eyes. People have become so acclimatized and used to the old system, they can't seem to be able to tear themselves out of it. Since May 2018, we've had a chance to return to the perfect model. If we as a people are wise, then we should strive to make the nation's governing institutions more and more separate and more and more independent and more and more just. This new government or any new government and the judiciary and the legislature must act as a government bound by the rule of law in a separation of powers. Terima kasih for watching. You know, I have a friend here called Adi, who's been holding a teleprompter so that I can speak. Uh, I've got Faisal here who's been driving me around and I've got this guy, Zol, who has been doing the work of the camera and adjusting my tripod for me, who have helped me with this shooting. As you can see, there is the sea behind me and you can hear the crashing waves, right? What a wonderful place Lanka is. This is God's great paradise on earth. Paradise 101. Good night.